so here's an example for the, the OH molecule, one of our favorite radicals. In its ground state, its total angular momentum is three halves, and there's a rotational progression above that. And so these, the parity is switching from one to the other. And so I could imagine putting on a field big enough to, um, to mix these together. It's a fairly large field in OH. Um, but within this J equals three halves manifold down here, I have the lambda doublet. And that allows me to, uh, to mix parity states fairly readily. So here's, here's the diagram. It didn't show up great, actually. But here are the states of one parity in zero field. Here are the states of another parity uh, in, in zero field. This is energy on this axis in Kelvin. And this is electric field in volts per centimeter going up to about 1,000 out here. And there's, there's hyperfine structure and there's details. But the main thing is, you turn on the electric field, some states go down and some states go up. This is kind of the generic thing you would want. If it was all just dipoles in the strong field limit, you would just see these slopes are all the same, dipole moments are all the same. But of course, the dipoles can be manipulated by turning on the field because you're moving around the pieces, you're moving around the various states there. In the high field limit, in the simplest approximation, you can ask what is the dipole moment of this molecule? And the actual dipole moment, as realized in the large field limit, is sort of the the base dipole moment, the dipole moment in the reference frame of the molecule, times some geometrical factor here that involves the projection of angular momentum on the field axis, the projection of the electron angular momentum on the molecular axis, and then you know, numbers here, the, the total J is fixed there. And you can see this graphically in a picture like this. There's, there's actually a lot going on because the, the lambda doublet implies there was another degeneracy here that you have to take into account. This is the basic picture. Here's the molecule. Two atoms are different, and so there's a dipole moment that points off in some direction. And the electric dipole moment is along the axis of the molecule. Where else could it be? Because that's the stick that defines where the positive and negative charges are. And the, uh, the electron is not shown, but its, uh, its presence is felt nevertheless. In this sort of quasi-classical picture, there could be a total angular momentum pointing off in this direction. Let's say the field is pointing vertically. And so in this orientation, this is telling me that the projection of the, you know what, I'm going to use the point at the stick. <coughs> Here we go. <laughs> if the angular momentum is like this, then its projection onto the laboratory frame is positive, and that's kind of telling the molecule how it knows where the field is. There it is. And down here, the projection of the electron onto the axis here, which has a certain sense of rotation with respect to the dipole, is pointing this way. It, it is, sorry, the projection is over here, also positive. And that's telling you where the dipole is in relation to the angular momentum. And so these two numbers, taken together, are telling the dipole, oh yeah, you're, you're pointing aligned, more or less aligned with the field. And the dipole has a certain sign, m times omega. Whereas, uh, let's see, a different situation might be that same angular momentum is, uh, has the projection onto the lab axis, and m greater than zero is telling the molecule, oh, the, the electric field is pointing that way. But alas, in this case, the electron is spinning the other direction, and it's telling you that if omega is less than zero, therefore, the dipole moment must be pointing in the other direction. And so these numbers code the fact that the molecule is pointing away from the field, and the ch sign will change in this, and the dipole moment has effectively different sign for that. Right, so that's how and then there are two other cases. This is how the, the pieces fit together. The electron helps the molecule orient itself. Okay, then, what's the next thing? Oh my gosh, now look at this. Here's a case where I have a Hunt's case A molecule. So I have a, a stick with charges at either end. I have an electric dipole moment. I have the, the electron going around you know, one way or the other. And so there's a magnetic dipole moment. And to a very good approximation, because the electron is orbiting around this axis, the magnetic dipole moment is pretty much aligned along that same axis. It's not quite, I think this would be an idea. <laughs> it's not quite perfectly along that axis. There are off diagonal matrix elements because of Coriolis coupling or whatever words you want to put to that. But basically, you think of this molecule as having an electric dipole moment and a magnetic dipole moment that are collinear. And they might point in the same direction, but they might point in opposite directions because of the way the, the electron orbits around this, uh, around this axis. And so, you know, which, oh my gosh, there's some kind of confusion possibly going on here. We've, 
we've left Maxwell far behind at this point. This is really made of a lot of stuff. And now, contemplate the case, if you will, where we put these, this molecule in a field. No, we put it in two fields. There's an electric field and a magnetic field, and maybe they're not pointing in the same direction. And so the electric field will say, come, dipole moment, align along me, as you know is your destiny, right? And the magnetic, moment, magnetic field will talk to the magnetic moment and say, no, no, come over here, align along with me. And there's a competition, and it's making the parts of the molecule move to be immersed in this combination of fields. And what does it do? How do we describe the molecule in this combination of fields? Well, thank you. I'm glad you asked. So first of all, the Hamiltonian is, is growing longer and longer across the bottom of the page here. So we have the rotational, uh, rotational spectrum from zero field. We have the spin orbit interaction that makes sure the electron knows where the, the axis is. We have the lambda doubling. We have an electric field Hamiltonian. We have a magnetic field Hamiltonian. Those fields may point in different directions. This is uh, not even crazy. But that's a good phrase. I like that. This is not even crazy, right? This is a thing that might come up. It may be that you wanted to build a magnetic trap for OH molecules, and you you have a magnetic field that's inhomogeneous and trying to trap in the magnetic dipole moment, while at the same time you would like to turn on the, the the electric dipole so that you can get interesting dipolar interaction effects, whatever that might be. But they're in competition with each other, and it might screw you up. It might screw up your magnetic trap to have an electric field present which was, in fact, the case for the, the OH trap at Jilla. Uh, so that, this is something, it, it's, what I want to say is, this is a beautiful theoretical thing to work on, but that doesn't impress anybody. But in fact, it's also relevant in some way to, to some kind of experiment somewhere, so that makes it worthwhile. Um, so what do we do with that? How, how do I treat the idea that there are two fields on simultaneously? Well, I think maybe we've, Established this. Okay. So let's look at just the field part of the Hamiltonian. I have mu dot b, I have d dot e, and they're both acting simultaneously. I, I, I'm kind of glossing over a lot of things here. I'm assuming that the fields are small enough that these interactions are not mixing together different rotational states. I'm going to say, I'll talk about states where j is still a well defined quantum number. Uh, and yet, I want to be at fields. Uh, Fields small enough that the spin orbit coupling is strong enough that the, the electric dipole moment and the magnetic dipole moment still travel around together. That's important. But I want to see fields large enough that I don't care about the, the lambda doubling anymore. I want the Hamiltonian to be really sort of linear in the electric field. The, the moments of the linear electric field. I can do that. Uh, and so if the Hamiltonian is like this, you'll notice there's, there's a simple formula that it's all given by dot products. It's given by uh, four dot products, this thing, two, four quantities in two dot products. This thing got into this, this thing got into this. But in this approximation, this case A approximation, the electric and magnetic dipole moments share an axis. And so I can factor that out. Here is, here is the axis of the molecule, just given as a unit vector here. And when you think of that as kind of a moment dotted into an effective field, which is now a linear combination, of the electric and magnetic fields. What's the combination? Well, I'll just pull out the constant. The dipole moment goes along the electric field here. For the magnetic field, I need the magnetic moment. It's the G factor, it's the magneton, and it depends on the sign of the electron's orbital angular momentum around the, the axis, because that tells you whether the, dipole, the magnetic dipole moment is aligned or anti-aligned with the molecular axis. But this is a thing you can you can just write down and solve. This is easy. Uh, so this is an effective quantization axis here. And so what you do with that is you say for one sign of omega, if the magnetic dipole moment is pointing in the same direction as the electric dipole moment, then the direction of this effective field is here, somewhere between the E and B fields. So E is pulling this way, B is pulling this way, and the net result is something in between. And for a given value of the fields, and for a given value of omega, this is a perfectly good quantization axis. This Hamiltonian has, has analytically known eigenstates that are proportional to the m quantum number along this axis. Right? And so that's, uh, that's cool. And, and then there's another one. If, I, if the magnetic moment is pointing opposite to the direction of the electric 
dipole moment, then there's a different axis over here. But again, the, the m quantum numbers along that axis are perfectly good in this approximation. And so there's this wonderful situation experienced by the molecules. You would say, here's the electric field, and it declares an axis and says, there shall be quantization along this axis. The m quantum numbers are defined here. And the magnetic field says, no, I want the m quantum numbers to be defined over here. It's like the, the classic Reese's peanut butter cup conundrum. Okay? And this is saying they can come to a compromise, which of course was the solution to the Reese's peanut butter cup conundrum. Let's find an axis in the middle where m is still a good quantum number. And so, so that's a. John, just a good question. Yeah. M is good quantum number usually when you have cylindrical symmetry, when you have one field. Yeah. But now you have two fields. So <coughs> for me, it's not obvious, or I'm confused right now because you no longer have cylindrical symmetry in the external fields. Exactly. So why do you still have a good m quantum number? Yeah, yeah, that's why it's amazing, right? So, so there's, a, there's a detail to it. And the, the detail is, yes, a broken cylindrical symmetry. I don't have a single axis of cylindrical symmetry. But if I carve it up this way, I have two axes, each of which have their own cylindrical symmetry within a certain collection of states. So I break the problem down into electric and magnetic dipoles aligned versus electric and magnetic dipoles anti-parallel. Each of those cases, I get to write down an axis of cylindrical symmetry, even though there's not cylindrical symmetry for the whole problem that applies to all the states. If I carve up the states, I get to do this. Okay, and, and so this is, you know, we think of this as a Hun's case because this diagonalizes this part of the Hamiltonian. Later on, if you put the lambda doubling back in, uh, that mixes these together, and, and the cylindrical symmetry, even the cylindrical symmetry of this axis versus this axis is not great anymore. Up to this point, it's, it's kind of an intriguing idea. Um, what does it look like? So here's a, here's a case, oh yeah, so we, we coined a term for this, this is Hun's case X, because the fields are crossed with each other, like, <laughs> what? Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> And so the, the, the gist of it is, let me pick a particular case where the, the moments are parallel inside the molecule. And so this is the axis. And so the, the magnetic moment now depends on the, the strengths of both the fields plus the angle between them. And you can work it out. It's sort of the, the ordinary dipole moment that you would have guessed that depends on both the m and omega quantum numbers, where m is now referenced to this axis. And then there's a, a geometrical correction factor, which is given by the, the strength of the fields and, uh, and the angle. So it's, it's based on the construction that you use to add these together to get the effective axis. And so now we have sort of analytical formulas for the, the appropriate direction of the dipole and its magnitude. It's the kind of thing where ordinarily you would, would say, well, I have to pick one axis or the other. Let me pick the, the electric field as a quantization axis. And then I turn on the magnetic interaction, and I get the states mixed together, and I kind of have to, oh, you know, I numerically diagonalize a Hamiltonian or whatever, and I get eigenstates, and I calculate something. And you could get to this point. But here, it's just laid out for front There's a formula, and the formula gives me immediately the direction of the dipole, and it's magnetic. We'll come back to this formula probably in the lecture. Thursday. Oh. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, except this. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Here's an application of it, just to see what it looks like. Here's the OH molecule in a largish uh, electric field, 5 kilovolts per centimeter. And here are some energies of the ground state of that molecule as a function of magnetic field. So we're looking at kind of the Zeeman effect, if you will, of an OH molecule in an electric field. What can it look like? Well. Here, the angle between the two fields is equal to zero. And so when the magnetic field is itself equal to zero, I get the, the three halves spin of the ground state of the OH molecule splits into these four components because of the presence of the electric field. Each of those four components is doubly degenerate by the way we talked about it, because you know, for, for any given m, there's plus and minus values of omega. Uh, and so they come in two categories which are shown here as the solid and dashed lines. If I turn on the magnetic field and there's no angle between the fields, then the, the case where the dipoles were already aligned with each other, I'm already, I've already got the electric field holding the dipole moment, the electric dipole moment like this, the magnetic dipole moment is in the same direction. I turn on the magnetic field, that increases the energy. So 
So these four energies just keep growing with magnetic field. Nothing amazing there. The other case with the magnetic dipole points opposite the, the direction that the electric dipole is already polarized, the opposite happens. And so, so in this state, there's there's the um, magnetic dipole moment aligned with electric dipole moment, magnetic dipole moment, anti-aligned dipole moment, and so on for the other ones. And then there's just some crossing there because they're really degenerate. This is a case where the fields are parallel and the fields together have jointly decided this is the quantization axis and they agree on it. And so these, these are the usual rigorous eigenstates you think of. Here's the case where you rotate the magnetic field by 45 degrees with respect to the electric field. And you see kind of the same phenomena going on. The dipole, magnetic dipole is more or less aligned with the electric dipole, then the energy just grow. In the other case, these crossings that were just plain crossings when there was perfect cylindrical symmetry become anti-crossing, you know, avoided crossings. And this is what you would get. You said, I'll start with, in zero magnetic field, I have a quantization axis along the electric field. And I'll calculate using that basis. And of course, those states mix with each other, and they give avoided crossings like this. It's, that's the kind of thing you would expect to see. But these curves were actually generated by, by the, the gimmick given before. So at each magnetic field, there is uh, a well-defined direction of magnetic moment, and therefore quantization axis. And these are rigorously good quantum numbers for the dash states along one axis with the solid states along the other axis. And, and it just comes out at you. Oh. So that's cool. Um, we wrote this down as a curiosity. I think probably we should go back and, and do more with this, because I think there's a lot of power on this. But that's as far as it goes so far. Oh, and so then, we'll stop. Uh, and and the, the intermission comes as a break in the middle because now I'm done sort of talking about just dipoles by themselves, and we're going to talk about dipoles colliding and interacting. So maybe it's a good time to stop and see does anybody want to pose questions about the dipoles themselves? Maybe at some point you had this transparency where you had a larger b. I think it was sort of in this case a, where the spin axis interaction coefficient was larger than the rotational constant. Yeah. Can you comment for which one was this is the case and for what model it's not? So, so, so my rule of thumb, uh, and this is for diatomic molecules. Yeah. The, the rule of thumb that I keep in mind is sigma state molecules uh, have no spin orbit at all because mm -hmm. there's no orbit, mm -hmm. uh, and so those are perfectly good case. A molecule, uh, case B molecules, whereas things with non-zero angular high states and delta states, um, and I, I might be putting my foot in it here, but I think in, in low rotational states, those are pretty good case A molecules. And then you can see these progressions where you go to higher and higher rotational states, then it's not really just the constant that matters, it's, yeah. it's B, J, J plus one. And so at some point high enough in the spectrum, it goes over the case to be on its own. And, and those things decouple again. And that's also interesting to, to look at that transition between A and B. But that's that's about my understanding. May I make this? I don't know. Uh, is that time reversal symmetry also playing a role at a certain point if you have magnetic and magnetic and electric fields? Sure. <laughs> Uh, to elaborate on that answer, I have never thought about it. Um, you know, in a pure magnetic field, there's a generalized time reversal symmetry. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's an interesting. I mean, the, the answer is yes, it must be because um, this, this. We just to go back. This sort of picture of th this one, where you have kind of the, the four states here that give the different distributions of things. This knows about things like that. Yes. And the EDM me measurements uh, exploit uh, measurements between states of this kind, uh, looking for that kind of violation of time reversal symmetry. Um, that's not a satisfying answer because I haven't thought in any detail about that. But, um, it's a good question. So, but, you know, I, I have the two axes of quantization. Right. Are they different regarding time reversal? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. They map up to each other, right? Because time yeah. reversal would. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're not eigenstates of time reversal, but you know where they go. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, what consequence that has for all of mm -hmm. this? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Anything else? Yeah. All right. So now we have dipoles, and because dipoles are made of stuff, their dipole moments can be manipulated. Uh, and that's pretty interesting. We'll, we'll have a lot more to say about that in the lecture on Thursday. But for now, I want to talk about cases where the, the structure of the object is frozen in. The dipole is a fixed sort of object. So in that case, uh, let's go back to magnetic dipole moments, which have much less structure in them. And in fact, now I, I have to go to the board here. So the, the thing we're going to think about is, you. oh, thank you. <laughs> you know these great magnetic atoms, dysprosium and erbium, which uh, can be laser cooled, can be closed condensed, uh, they're fantastic. The, the most recent thing is they've observed the solid, the super solid phase in these things, um, whatever that means. Tom <laughs> has done this, Francesca Galeno has done this. But, but for now, we're, we're doing something a lot simpler. I'm not thinking about the quantum degenerate phase. It, interesting though that is. But uh, these are magnetic objects, and if I take, here's a magnetic field, and, and I think of the energies as normal. The dysprosium, for example, has J equals eight? Eight. Eight, thank you. Uh, eight or, or 10, is that the one with 10? Six. Six. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a big number. <laughs> it's an absolutely gigantic number. And so a magnetic field, and this is why I didn't, I didn't try to make a slide here, because it means so much work. Okay. This, this splits into, let's see, 2 times 8 plus 1, 17 states. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, something like that. <laughs> and there's other structure up there, but if you're low enough fields, you see, you see the states coming out. You pick the lowest one. Here it is. And so now you're considering scattering problems where these are dipolar particles, they're polarized, they have a magnetic moment that's well defined, and the slope of this line in the right range of fields is really constant. So you're not messing with the magnetic field, you're leaving that dipole moment alone. So that's just a number that you can pull out. If they're in the ground state and they're cold enough, they will not collide with each other and go to any higher state, so there are no inelastic scattering processes there. They are, there is one other thing they might do, and that is if they scatter together with some dipole moments, there's, gosh, awful big anisotropic interactions in their scattering, and they might kick up to a different spin state and resonate in that. Here's a, here's a partial picture of some of the resonances. This is an air beam. Thank you. Um, so here in the field range up to 70 Gauss, there's, there are rather a lot of resonances here, and that's not the kind of scattering I want to talk about. That's the scattering of the dipoles at some point in the process have changed their dipole moment and they're doing something else in the resonance. I want to stay away from that. So let's imagine an experiment where you stand at some field where there's no resonance there. So now the dipoles are just dipoles. They are, they are the simple point dipoles that we've been trying so hard to get away from. But it makes a good baseline. Let's see how they scatter. And so the, the dipole interaction, I imagine they're polarized <coughs> in the laboratory frame and so they have an angular dependence which is the one minus three cosine theta that you Cosine squared theta, sorry about that. <laughs> cosine squared theta. And significantly, the coefficient here, the dipole moment itself, is a fixed number. I don't have to worry about how that's changing during the collision and how changing the fields is just a number. And so this is kind of the simplest level of scattering of dipoles. I have the very basic uh, anisotropy, I have the one over R cube. And you just want to know what it's like for these dipoles to scatter in ultra low temperatures. And so you do the normal thing. You take the wave function, you expand in partial waves. That's, that's actually not that interesting. And the, uh, the, the main part here is you get matrix elements of the dipole interaction between two partial waves. And blah, 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 blah comes out to whatever it is. But the point is, here, uh, the m quantum number, the projection of the relative orbital angular momentum around the axis, is conserved, as it must be. And the uh, the partial waves themselves can change by two. The, if you like the dipole interaction as a second rank tensor, it can change angular momentum by two upon collision. So, so in a scattering process, I could imagine 
uh, I look at the S-wave part of it, and they come together in S-waves, something goes on, torques are exerted, and they come out in D-waves, for example. Or they come in in D-waves, they come out in D-waves also. And so this is about as simple as it gets for dipoles. And we're just interested in scattering cross-section. So uh, you've seen that. And so, so what you have is a set of, if I make a partial wave expansion, and I know that angular momentum can change, then I get a set of scattering amplitudes uh, that I just denote T, where arrow goes to L. And these are the analogs of the, the analogs of nothing. These are the scattering amplitudes. Right? And if L equals zero and L prime equals zero, that's the ordinary S-wave scattering amplitude, which is you know, either equal to or proportional to the scattering length. That's a, a thing you're familiar with. And so here's some of these from a calculation in from some other dipole, never mind what it is, but here's energy on this axis, and here are the, these T matrix elements here on this axis. The S wave one, scattered from zero to zero partial waves, does its thing, but then it, at very low temperatures, it's, it's converging to some S wave scattering. That's the behavior you're used to. Um, what you may be less familiar with is if I look at some of the other ones, like here's, here's uh, scattering in on partial wave two, scattering out on partial wave two, <laughs> it's the one with the big circle. It's this one, I guess. It, it does its thing, but it also tends to a constant at low energy. And the off diagonal one that comes in on zero and goes off on two, let's say it's this one. Uh, let's say it's this It doesn't really matter. Let's say it's this one. You know, it also goes there. And in fact, if you look at the, these, these partial wave scattering amplitudes from any partial wave, L, to any other partial wave, L prime, which is within two of the original, they all have the same threshold law in zero energy. They are all independent of energy. And that's an astonishing fact. If I look at the, uh, in the usual way, I look at potential energy curves as a function of the distance between things. You know what it looks like. There's something down here. I don't know what that is. I don't care what that is. But S waves come in like this. And D waves, think about identical bosons, come in like this. And G waves come in up here like this. And I'm at ultra low energies, and so my collision energy is down here somewhere. And it means I'm going to reflect off this centrifugal barrier. Forget about dipole interactions. I'm going to, uh, I'll scatter off of this, and I'll never get anywhere close together. And you would say, well, therefore, as I go to lower and lower energies, this turning point gets further and further out, and I'm less susceptible to the potentials that act between the, the molecules. But here's the thing. For the dipole interaction, the one over R cubed interaction, there's just enough potential out there to still do a tiny little bit of scattering. It's like Coulomb scattering, Rutherford scattering. No, no matter how big the impact parameter is between two charged objects, there's a little bit of deflection there. And it's the same for dipoles. There's a little bit of deflection. And the way it plays out, there's, I guess there's math or whatever, but the way it plays out is, uh, Every cross section has the same threshold. Every, every, sorry, every scattering amplitude that's uh, that's, di that's allowed by this transition has the same threshold law. And so, in the zero energy limit, right down the cross section, I have to sum all the partial waves. And you hope that that partial wave sum converges. Hope nothing. We can go look at it. So here, John, what internal state did you assume here? These are <coughs> which spin states, not the. the, the the lowest stretched one here. Uh, sorry, sorry. So if you have two in the lowest stretched one, where do they go? They, they scatter elastically and come back out in the lowest. It's elastic. This, this is purely elastic. So the kind of the, the goal of this part is just to ask ourselves: there's an anisotropic interaction. Does that show up in anisotropic elastic scattering? So that's all I'm looking at at the moment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, so how does it work? Here's an example. I have here the, uh, I have the plane. The plane, here it is, the XY plane. And I'm scattering two dipoles. And the dipoles are polarized orthogonal to the plane. And the incident direction of scattering is in this direction. We'll call it the x-axis. And I happen to know, by having you know, gone to the end of the problem, that the, this, the differential cross-section in this plane is isotropic, should not depend on the angle. Let's see what partial waves have to say about that. If I put in four partial waves into this expansion, here's the, here's the circle that I should be getting. This is the isotropic cross-section. Here's what four partial waves give me, and it's terrible. 
And the, the reason is, I, I should have elaborated on this, the, the um, oh my gosh, no, I should have really elaborated on this. Sorry about that. I go back to this point. Um, these are numerically calculated scattering matrix elements, and they go to some limits here. Those red dashed lines are given by the Born approximation. We have analytical formulas for those. And you say Born approximation, that's supposed to be when particles are scattering really fast off of each other, like fast charged ions. And I say, no, it's not really that at all. The reason it works for fast charged ions is because it's, they're perturbative. They're, they, don't, they don't stick around and do anything elaborate. They just fly by and make a perturbation onto the scattering. And because of this circumstance, the lower I go in energy, the further away the molecules are, the smaller one of our cube is, the more perturbative this becomes. Born approximation works great up there. And, and this is the, the proof in the pudding. And so, so we have an analytical version of this. But look, I cannot apply that argument to S-wave scattering because that's not perturbative. That's molecules come in and really mix it up down here. So I have this weird situation. I have an infinite number of scattering amplitudes that I know analytically, and one that I'm just going to have to deal with. And so here's a case where I'm trying to get something isotropic out of this formula, but I'm not allowed to use the isotropic wave function to describe it. Man. And so I'm trying to describe a circle using non-zero partial waves. And, and it's a disaster, right? It's, it's absolute nuts. Uh, so put more partial waves in. What, what can you do, right? And here's more partial wave up to L equals 10. And so it's doing a better job of getting this circle out here. It's, you know, it looks less like a butterfly and more like a duck. That's always good. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. And I keep going. Put, this is now 80 partial waves in this thing. And now it's starting to do a not half bad job here. You can see this ringing around the edges. And it's a disaster up here. And part of the story is that um, the Born approximation, which we're using for this, does not, uh, let's, say, let's put it this way, it violates the optical theorem. It's not good at forward scattering. And so that's, that's kind of a problem. Uh, and so you get this sort of, what, what's the word? This thing of Fourier analysis where you're, Gibbs, the Gibbs, the Gibbs, thank you, the Gibbs phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of what's going on here. So that's, that's a nightmare. I don't want to sit there summing up an infinite number of partial waves. But I do know, if I believe the Born approximation, then I can use the plane wave Born approximation. I take all the partial waves together at once. They always tell you in grade school, when you're doing cold collision calculations, you always want to do a, a, a partial wave expansion, and also keep your hands off the other person's cookies. But here, we're saying, I know, I suspect, apart from the S wave, I feel like the Born approximation is pretty good. Born approximation I can do in, in plane waves just as well. And in fact, it comes out with analytical formulas. Here it is. So I have a case here where the, um, this E stands for the direction of polarization of the dipoles, just single dipoles now. They come in with relative momentum k hat and scatter out with relative momentum k prime hat. So there's the scattering amplitude. And there's just a formula that comes out for this. You can see it's going to have trouble in the forward scattering direction, so that's a little problematic. But never mind, we can make pictures of it. Here they are. These are differential cross sections in this geometry. So now, now the geometry gets a little weird. So I've got here, vertical on this axis is how these dipoles are uh, approaching one another. And relative to that, I have the polarization axis tilted off to some side. So, so here, here, for 80 equals 0, I have the field pointed vertically, the collisions are occurring uh, along that vertical axis. And what can they do? The, these are, in this case, they're identical fermions. They have to be zero in the midplane because that's the symmetry of fermions. And so they preferentially scatter forward and backwards, and there it is. Whereas if I go to a different case where they're colliding like this, but the polarization is rotated by 45 degrees, this is the 45 degrees, then they preferentially go off to the side. They scatter at 90 degrees. Um, I confess I don't have a lot of intuition for these diagrams, but I, I sure as heck have got the formula for it. And it's, it's wildly anisotropic. All right, then what can we do with that? What's the consequence of this for an experiment? Uh, oh, 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 so first of all, what does this get you? If I have an analytical formula for the scattering amplitude, then I can do things like integrate it up and find the total cross-section which is important for getting the collision rates for the, for the dipole. And so I can do that. And it's in terms of kind of the following quantity. There's a characteristic length scale 
for dipole scattering. It's more or less, if you look at a picture like this, out here I'm dominated by one over r squared um, centrifugal repulsion. At some point, I'm dominated here by one over r cubed dipole attraction, let's say, if there's attraction in this channel. The scale in which that change occurs is some characteristic length scale, where I set dipole interaction on that length scale equal to kinetic energy on that length scale. And I get a, a characteristic dipole length. Okay. Um, and I put numbers to that. So for dysprosium, which has a, a pretty big magnetic dipole moment, that length scale is a, a 193 bore radii, big. Right? Uh, you may have seen the number 64 or whatever, one third of this number, because other people for other purposes have different definitions of the dipole length, but, uh, but that's fine. Uh, and for a polar molecule like KRB, it gets uh, truly wonderfully big. And I know the cross section analytically in terms of this dipole cross section, and so I can come up with things like this. For identical bosons, the total scattering cross section is proportional to the dipole length squared with some numerical coefficient that comes from the from only averaging. And then it has the ordinary S wave scattering component there, 8 by the squared. And for fermions, there's no there's no scattering length, but there's still a contribution from the dipole scattering squared. And that's significant. This comes from this idea that all partial waves have scattering, even at zero, uh, zero collision energy. Fermions, if they're dipolar, still scatter in ultra-cold temperatures. You can do evaporative cooling of these things. And I think, from my understanding, that's how the first Fermi degenerate gas of, of dysprosium and or ergon was made, just in evaporative cooling, because the cross-sections are so big. And the other point about this is you're used to the fact that, oh, you can put resonances in or whatever, and so you have the, the scattering length can be made quite large. Elastic scattering of S-wave entities can be very, very large. And that's kind of an interference effect. You say there's, there's the um, dang it, something, something minimum. It's gone. But anyway, there are interference effects that give you large scattering lengths. But this is not like that at all. This is scattering on a length scale of, of AD because they're really scattering length scales AD. There's always, no matter how far apart they are, well, if they're on this scale, there are still little pushes being given to the dipoles by each other on that scale. It's a, it's a real scattering thing. What does it do? So that's, that's the scale. That sort of normalizes everything. But now you can ask, is it an observable thing? And the answer is, yeah, collisions go toward, uh, toward re-thermalization of a non-equilibrium gas. So here's a great experiment. This was done uh, in the group of Francesca Ferleno using, I'm going to say Arium. So we have a, a trap here, an elongated trap of, of Arium atoms. It's not Bose-convinced. It's just a thermal gas there. And along the long axis, one can suddenly, like this, you can suddenly squeeze that in, and it gives preferentially higher mean Newton squared velocity to things moving in this direction as opposed to things moving in this direction. And then, if you wait and look at sort of the temperature distributions in the two, two directions, or the momentum distribution, then, then the, uh, the collisions are responsible for taking the excess momentum in this direction and whoop, shunting it off into the side direction. So you should see the temperature going down in the hot direction and up in the cold direction. And they can make that measurement. And, of course, these are polar objects, and the axis of polarization can be tilted from between parallel to the original kick all the way to perpendicular to the original kick. Uh, and so they did that. Here's how you, you think about that, how you analyze that. The, um, there's a, a relaxation time. So you watch the temperature, the temperature starts high, relaxes down to its equilibrium temperature, and there's a characteristic time that goes along with that. What is that? Well, it's 1 over n sigma v. So they know, uh, experimentally, they know the mean density, they know the mean velocity, they know the total cross-section, which is the number we can provide. That's the number that was on the previous screen. And then there's a, a kind of, um, Oh, it's kind of a bunch factor, right? It's, it's the proportionality constant here that has to do with how efficient the collisions are at taking things that collide in the hot axis and transferring them to the cold axis. So it's the, um, 
it's the kind of cross section you would need to, to describe uh, momentum transport or viscosity or some, something like that. It's the, if, if the collisions are very good at, at, uh, at changing the direction of momentum, you'll get faster re relaxation. That's a concept that we can calculate because we have the uh, red formulas for the cross sections. But in the experiment, they measure this, they measure this, they measure this. This is just a single number, which we also give them. But they can use this to extract that, that number alpha, which we think of as the number of collisions per re-thermalization or something like that. And here's what it looks like. So, this yeah. is you know, kind of a geometric. I mean, the, the fact that you've got large angle scattering has got to be inside the cross section in theory, right? The, the, the alpha is some kind yeah. of order unity which has to do with geometry or Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is this is kind of a normalization. So you calculate, um, yeah. So there's a there's a there's an averaging over the cross section that gives you the total cross section. There is a different averaging over the cross section that gives you the rethermalization rate. Yeah. And both of those are proportional to. So this, this alpha. Uh, let's see. I guess it's not obvious in the in the formula, but the alpha comes out dimensionless. Well, both are from theory. Both you can increase the by theory. So to really distinguish the two contributions. What do you mean by two contributions? I mean one is the cross section and the other one is the one you should have to. Um, yeah, so you, you mean these two factors? Right. Yeah. So so both the, the theory and experiment works with the same value of sigma which we calculated. So that's that's kind of an overall normalization to this. And, and it matters because the overall cross section depends on the. Uh, well, no, not take that That's that's a number for normalizing. We calculate this one, but when they measure it, to, for them to measure this value, they need our value of sigma to, to normalize their rate to be consistent with our alpha. So you calculate both sigma and alpha. Yeah, we do. The, the sigma is the easy part. The alpha depends on. Experimental circumstances. Uh, and here's how it goes. So this is the alpha as a function of the tilt angle of the dipoles. The and there's the so the rethermalization rate is varying by a factor of two or so. Uh, so yeah, by a factor of two, just by virtue of the tilt of the dipole axis. And you can kind of see it if I look at let's see which which is the case. If I go to 90 degrees, that is to say the the uh, the dipole is parallel to the axis that was originally uh, shaken, then this cross section takes this weird form. It's, it's for whatever reason, it's mostly forward scattering. The, again, the vertical axis is the initial axis. So those molecules hit each other, but more or less keep going in this direction. They don't transfer momentum the other way. And so the relaxation time is comparatively long. But then there was this case at 45 degrees. That was the case we talked about before. That's really, really good. It, shunting momentum to the side, and so the relaxation is much faster. And so the point is just pure elastic scattering not only has large cross sections in collision rates, which are kind of new, but also has really anisotropy. The anisotropy of the dipole interaction translates into elastic scattering. Uh, and I think that's, oh, and then and bosons, uh, this is a, a small addendum to that boson. As you can see, this formula is completely different from the other one. It's got uh, an extra constant there, and it's got a scattering length. And so, you know, now we're sort of emboldened by the aerobium experiment, which was in fermions, by the way. There was no scattering length there. That, that's kind of important. Uh, and, and so we just got it. In the boson case, we don't know the scattering length, but we feel pretty confident now that we know the dipole part. And so one can do the same experiment and do these, this relaxation. Uh, and Ben Lev did that experiment in dysprosium 162. And so here's the, some of the actual relaxation data. So there's one of the cold axes in his experiment uh, is getting hotter, and there's the data. And then these are calculations for different versions, different values of the scattering. And so you can kind of say, this one's much too low, obviously that one's much too high, and this one is just right. And so based on that experiment, an actual collision experiment, was the first measurement, to my knowledge, of the scattering length of a highly dipolar molecule. And you get it because you, you feel like you understand everything about the scattering except the, the scattering length itself, like you measure. All right, I think 
that's it for today. I'm going to skip over this uh, and leave you with this. Oh no! The Caped Crusader trapped like a rat in the world's biggest rat trap, while Robin looks on helplessly. All right. So, so today what we've talked about is the, the effects of thermalization, the anisotropy of thermalization, because dipoles, you know, dipoles are going to dipole. They are anisotropic, and so their elastic scattering cross sections are anisotropic in a way that, that can be quantified, uh, and, and that has cool physics in it, I think. But uh, in the world of cold molecules, it is going to become important that there are other states available. And that's the first part of this talk was talking about the moving pieces and all the stuff that goes together to make those dipoles, that can make uh, collisions that you wanted to be elastic, can make them inelastic. And, and there are many ways to do that um, and to try to stop it from doing that. And that'll be the topic on Thursday's talk. So I'll stop here for today. Thank you. If I have a gas of uh, fermionic polar atoms, uh, all in the same state, you're saying that they can still have S wave scattering, elastic scattering, <coughs> because of the dipole. That's right? that's two different statements. They can still have elastic scattering, but the elastic scattering is anything but S wave. Oh, sorry. Yes, but like is it some sort of an uh, some something that resembles something that would not happen for non-polar fermions. Exactly. In the same yeah. state, they will just go by each other. They'll bounce yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, scattering process, is there, is, um, uh, is there any way to control how much they scatter other than orientation of the dipoles? Um, uh, well, how do you mean? What are you trying to control? Like, can you turn these interactions off if you wanted to? Um, uh, depends on the dipoles, right? So in, in this case, here in the dysprosium, uh, you're saying you want to make the, the, the size of the dipole smaller. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, uh, over a pretty big field range, this slope is constant. This diagram doesn't care. So these you could not change. If there's another hyperfine state up there, and there is, and, and uh, in the fermions actually, there's another one. And then you would see, you know, the usual kind of these guys would go up and they would repel some going down, just like in the rubidium case. And and sure, yeah, there would be a state where the, the dipole moment would be a function of magnetic field. Uh, I, I don't have the actual. But if it's not in the stretch state at the lowest energy, are you not risking inelastic collisions at that point? For sure. Yeah. So there's no like optimal. Well, um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you take your chances. Right? And you ask, how big? How how rapid are the inelastics getting? Yeah, yeah, and if I can turn off the scattering. Oh. By turning off the scattering wing. Well, so his goal was, so maybe I don't know what you're talking about, but he had. Yeah, the I, in, in the dipolar BEC, uh, that's a different story. So then, if you have the, you know, the quantum degenerate gas of fermion, uh, well, of bosons actually in that case, and, and they're free to run around like a fluid and they attract in some cases, that gas can be unstable uh, under macroscopic collapse collapse of the gas. It can be made stabilized by a big enough S wave scattering length that's a kind of effective propulsion. And then yeah, Tillman shut off the S wave scattering length to trigger that collapse. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So uh, will you show that uh, scatterness calculation for this person uh, the PRB and also PRB like PRB is a much, much bigger, like a thousand four radius, right? Yeah. So in that case if we want to uh, assume we want to do the similar summarization measurement on PRB. That's kind of hard for such big scatter analysis. Yeah, you you tell me. It sounds <laughs> no, like. No, I don't. I mean, it's. What's the, that? The problem is any loss of position. I mean, this was all worked out for PRB first, right? and then because it because we were performing rethermalization experiment, but the problem is any loss of loss. Yeah, but, but people are trying to use a quasi 2 d confined uh, to reduce uh, to reduce the chemical reaction. Uh, but but that just means you re faster. I mean, they've always died So yeah, so then it, it comes down to 
you would love to have lots of elastic collisions to, to your cooling or whatever, but if there are lots of inelastic collisions, which can't be because you know, then you have to do something about it to shield it in some way. And that, that's what the 2D. Yeah, actually, the question I'm trying to ask is even you don't consider, like, ignore the uh, chemical reaction or something, even at such large scatter amounts, the swing body recombination also going to be a problem. Could be. Yeah. But they're fine. Yeah, but the they're 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 non zero experience. Yeah, I, I, no, it's, it's, it's yeah, I mean, what, what what do three polar fermions do? What's the three motor combination? I mean, the the there, there's some work. I, I don't remember what the upshot was. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if I mean this is we basically work in the area where there's lots something can go wrong. <laughs> it is likely but, but I mean that that's a glib comment, obviously. But but it is true, fermions have probably less three body combination than bosons. It's a question of how much else. Yeah, I don't know that. Maybe. Maybe. Once, once the, the three bodies are together, they can go all sorts of uh, yeah. state changing. Yeah, yeah. But if you're, you know, if you're in a two D gas and you have a maybe yeah. they, maybe they don't get close enough to do that. Other questions? The hints you were looking for, this minimum of the scattering mass, it rounds over time. Thank you. Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> Beautiful interference effect in this elastic standard. So, thank you very much. Thank you, John.